When a spring is compressed or stretched, a force is exerted on it and its particles are displaced from its initial position. When a force causes a displacement, this means that work is done on the system. And when work is done on a system, energy is transferred or stored on the system. Let's look at the energy stored on a spring when it is compressed or stretched. Let the equilibrium position be the position when the spring is neither stretched nor compressed. On the second frame, we stretch the spring to an initial position and we label this position as x sub 0. And on the third frame, the block has momentarily moved to another position which we label as x. So let me extend this imaginary guides. During the displacement from x sub 0 to x, we write the work done by the spring on the object as work from point x sub 0 to x is equal to the force of the spring, x sub x, multiplied to the displacement from x sub 0 to x. So recall that the force exerted by the spring is negative kx. So I'll just write negative kx dx. And this is equal to negative 1 half kx squared evaluated from x sub 0 to x. And we'll end up with work is equal to negative of 1 half kx squared minus 1 half kx sub 0 squared. And since this has a unit of energy and it's equated on two terms, these two terms must have unit of energy. So let's just symbolize this with u sub x minus u sub x sub 0. The work done is equal to a change in energy. And these terms here have a special name and this is what we call elastic potential energy. So this equation tells us that when work is done on a spring, you're actually introducing a change in potential energy in the system. When we focus on individual terms, this is actually the potential energy stored in the deformation of the spring. This problem is from OpenStax University Physics Volume 1 Chapter on Oscillations. The length of nylon rope from which a mountain climber is suspended has an effective force constant of 1.4 times 10 raised to 4 newton per meter. In Part A, what is the frequency at which he bounces given his mass plus the mass of his equipment are 90 kilograms? So let's try to draw the system. Let's assume that this is the ceiling where the mountain climber is attached. And if this is the rope and this is the mountain climber. So let's assume that this is its equilibrium position. So at this point, the nylon rope is neither compressed or stretched, but it says here that when he's given a minor nudge, he bounces back and forth at this point. So we are asked, what is the mountain climber's frequency? So let me label here part A. So in previous discussion, if we assume that the compression or tension that this nylon rope exerts on the mountain climber is directly proportional to the length of distortion, then we will arrive at this expression where the angular frequency of oscillation is equal to square root of force constant divided by mass. But we are asked for the frequency and recall that angular frequency is equal to 2 pi f. Hence, I can write this in terms of frequency which is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of k over m. So plugging in the numerical values, we have f equals 1 over 2 pi square root of 1.4 times 10 raised to 4 newton per meter divided by 
0 kilograms. And plugging in the numerical values, F is equal to 1.99 hertz. In part B, how much would this rope stretch to break the climber's fall if he free falls 2.0 meters before the rope runs out of slack? So let's redraw the system. This time, let's assume that this is the ceiling and this is the climber. And this is the rope, unstretched rope. When the rope is neither stretched nor compressed, it is at its equilibrium position. So here, the rope still has this what we call slack or this condition where it is neither stretched nor compressed. But it says here that the mountain climber experiences free fall 2 meters before this condition. Essentially, if this is the climber, this distance is 2.0 meters. Here's how I interpret part B. If the climber is in free fall, then the only force acting on him or her is gravity. Hence, the rope is not exerting force on it. That's why we have this illustration. So let's use conservation of energy to solve part B. This is the initial point and this is the final point. Let's assume that the rope or the nylon rope stretches to this length when the rope try to break the climber's fall. Let's label this amount of stretch as y sub s and this initial height as y sub 0. So at this initial point, let's try to write down the total energy. So this is the initial total energy. So using conservation of energy, this initial total energy must be equal to the final total energy. Meaning to say the total energy when the climber is at this point. So the initial total energy is just the gravitational potential energy if we assume that this line here is the zero level for gravitational potential energy. At this point, the rope is neither stretched nor compressed. Therefore, there's no stored elastic potential energy. And we also assume that momentarily this climber is at rest, so there's no kinetic energy. So this is the only initial energy we have. Then this is equal to here, the rope is already stretched. There's an elastic potential energy here. Plus, we already established the fact that this is the zero level for gravitational potential energy. Hence, at this point, we can record some gravitational potential energy. But since this is below this line, this level, we can assume that Y sub S should have an intrinsic negative sign. So later, I'll write this as negative. I'll just add this for now because the negative sign is in Y sub S. So if I try to write down the energies in detail, gravitational potential energy is mass times G or acceleration due to gravity times this height, which is for now, let's label it as Y sub zero, though this is equal to 2.0 meters. This is equal to the elastic potential energy, which is one half K times the amount of stretch, which is Y sub S squared, plus the gravitational potential energy, which is M G and the displacement of this climber from our zero level, which is Y sub S. Let me rearrange this into a quadratic equation because our target variable is actually y sub s. The amount of length that the rope stretches to break the climber's free fall. Times negative y sub s because this is below our zero level and I'll transfer this on the same side of this term so this becomes minus m g y sub zero equals zero. Let me plug in the values. Let me replace this with simple numerical values so that it would be easier to write.
this looks like a quadratic equation like a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero. So to get the roots x, which in our example it is y sub s. So if we have a quadratic equation to get the roots, this is just equal to x equals negative b positive minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Using this quadratic formula, y sub s is equal to Once we evaluate this square root, we have to decide whether we will be using its positive value or negative value. Let's try to use first this positive value. Let's indicate y sub s of positive. If we use this positive square root value, we end up with 56.9 centimeters. And apparently this is positive, so this is not what we are looking for since the displacement must be below the zero gravitational potential line. In other words, we're looking for a negative value of y sub s. Let's try to use the negative version of this square root value. We'll end up with negative 44.3 centimeters. So this is the value that we are looking for. So next part C, repeat both parts of this problem in the situation where twice this length of nylon rope is used. So in part C, we now have twice the length of the original nylon rope. So if this is the mountain climber, this is the unstretched rope and at equilibrium position, it has now twice the length. When it stretches in such a way, it cancels out the free fall. So this is now our new zero level because the rope has now twice the length of the original nylon rope. The force that the nylon rope exerts on the mountain climber is directly proportional to its length. Then it is safe to assume that this new displacement from the equilibrium position, let's just name it as y sub 2. So this y sub 2 here is equal to twice the value of y sub s but we cannot simply multiply this value to 2 because apparently the initial gravitational potential energy is not tied down to 2.0 meters but rather this is now equal to 4.0 meter let me just call this as mm, y sub 1 So there's now an interaction between initial gravitational potential energy and the stored energy here will be distributed as a combination of elastic potential energy at this point and gravitational potential energy at this point. Let us do the calculations for part C. Let me delete this. The initial total energy at this point is mg y sub 1. This is equal to the final total energy at this point. So this is equal to 1 half k sub y squared, but this y here is 2 sub y s squared plus mg at the displacement of this climber from our zero level gravitational potential energy, which is 2 y sub s. Let me arrange this in the form of quadratic equation. Plugging in the given numerical values, I'll end up with these numbers. Now I have this form that looks like a quadratic equation. And then in order for me to get the roots, which in this case, the value of y sub s, I'll use this quadratic formula. If I try to use the positive version of this square root value, I'll end up with positive 38.8 centimeters. And if I try to use the negative version of this square root value, I'll end up with negative 32.5 centimeters. But then again, what we are after here is this value y sub 2, which is equal to the twice the value of this y sub s. 
Hence, I'll just multiply this to 2. Again, we are choosing the negative root, which is this value, because based on our chosen zero-level gravitational potential energy, y sub 2 is below these levels, hence it must have a negative sign. So y sub 2 is equal to negative 65.0 centimeters. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell button for awesome updates. Thank you for watching.